This evening we're carrying on with The Reason for God, which is uh, our series looking at some of the challenges to Christian faith. And we are coming at this a little bit sideways tonight, looking at Psalm 19. And Psalm 19 can be found on page 530 of your church Bibles. Psalm 19, page 530 of your church Bibles. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he's pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, with a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good. Good evening. My name's Darren. Uh, I'm part of the team here at uh, St. Paul's, here at SPS. And uh, we are tonight carrying on with our Reason for God series. Uh, I'm just going to pray for us, uh, and then we'll get uh, stuck into uh, the text and have a little think about Psalm 19 and how that answers some of the things that science brings uh, to Christian faith. So let's just pray together and ask for God's help first. Lord, we thank you for all your blessings. We thank you, Lord, that as you've uh, poured your rain over this church today. We pray now that you would pour your Holy Spirit out. Lord, I pray that each of us here would be immersed in your Spirit this evening. I pray that you would be powerfully at work in our hearts and minds, that you would be opening us up, Lord, to hear you speak. Come, Holy Spirit, open our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Psalm 19 opens with these powerful statements. Nature is speaking. Nature's declaring. It's proclaiming. It's sending out its words to the ends of the earth. Declaring the glory of God. Declaring that someone made all of this. And because it's the natural world, the speech is silent. That is, it's not, it's not with words. It's non-verbal communication. We heard it there in verse 3. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. The natural world is telling us silently but powerfully about God. You may have wondered, why does nature have the effect that it does on us? Why does it fill us with such joy? Why does it fill us with such awe when we stand in front of it? Why does it fill us with such excitement? Some of the peak experiences in my life have been in the context of nature when I've been walking through German forests or spending time in the Pyrenees in the south of France or walking along coastal paths in Cornwall looking out to the sea. And nature makes us curious as well, doesn't it? It makes us want to know and understand more and, you know, get to grips with stuff and really find out what's going on. Uh, I live just across the road with with Bob and with Leon, uh, and we've got the uh, Frozen Planet DVDs, or it might be on the hard drive, something like that. Um, And we've watched them, and we've watched that clip of the seal pup and the killer whale, I don't know how many times it just fills us with awe and excitement about what nature gets up to. 
Why does nature have this impact on us? Why do we write poems about it? Why do we write, make TV programs about it? Why do we use science to try and understand it more? Well, Psalm 19 tells us that it's because nature is telling us about God. It's telling us all about God's glory. It's saying, here is purpose. Here is meaning. Here is design. God exists. He created all this. And human beings matter. And there's no place on earth where this isn't heard. There's no human being on earth who hasn't heard this. Verse 4, their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. There is no human being who has not heard nature proclaim the glory of God. And there's no higher view of the natural world than this biblical view. There is no higher view of the natural world than this biblical view. Unfortunately, it's not the view that's shared by most people uh, in our culture today. The Western secular view is very much that the universe is a product of chance, that human beings got here because animals ate one another and the ones who didn't get eaten survived. But that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that the whole of nature is praising God, worshipping God, singing to God about how glorious he is. Psalm 148, David says, Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. You can hear that sense of awe. You can hear that sense of respect for the universe, that sense of awe at the meaningfulness of human life and human existence and the creator who has made all of this possible. And this is available to everyone, not just God's people. This is available to every human being. This is how generous our God is. God's eternal power and his divine nature can be known from what he has made. Paul says, Romans chapter 1. God's eternal power and his divine nature can be known from what he has made. And it's because of this high biblical view of nature that science has emerged to have a central place in Western culture. It's out of this high biblical view, this high view of nature, that science has emerged to be so significant and so important in European culture, in Western culture, because there's an expectation that when we look at nature, when we look at the created world, that there's something to be gained from doing that, that there's something to be learned from studying nature, there's something to be got from observing it, from considering it, from thinking about how it works. And so given that then, why is there sometimes such a tension between science on the one hand and Christian faith on the other? Do science and faith, in fact, contradict each other? Is there a fight between science and faith? Well, Richard Dawkins claims in his book, The God Delusion, that only a tiny minority of scientists believe in any kind of God, and he gives the impression that, in fact, all atheistic scientists would agree with him, that, in fact, no rational, rash, rational scientific mind could possibly believe in God. But this just isn't true. There are plenty of Christian scientists. Stephen Jay Gould, a physicist, writes, "'Either half my colleagues are enormously stupid, "'or else the science of Darwinism "'is fully compatible with conventional religious beliefs.'" and equally compatible with atheism. The idea that science and faith are necessarily locked in battle just isn't true. There are many scientists who are believers, and there are many scientists who aren't. 
Uh, in the New Scientist magazine, uh, there was a leader recently, this is the New Scientist, I strongly recommend this to you. Uh, if you're at all interested in science, uh, really grab this and read it on a train journey or something like that. Um, there's, there's a sort of God itch which constantly comes up in this magazine. Scientists just don't seem to be able to leave it alone, and this issue is all about God. As you can see, it's the God issue. Um, but I'd recommend it, just grab the latest one and find out what's going on in the world of quantum physics. Um, <laughs> the New Scientist leader was said religion is etched in human nature and cannot be dismissed as ignorance or indoctrination. So that's a contemporary uh, science magazine for you. So where does this tension come from? Because it is there, isn't it? Where does this tension come from? Well, in order to understand that a little bit better, we need to go back to the 18th century, back to the 1700s, to the European Enlightenment, which was a time of enormous revolutions in all sorts of areas. And one of the kind of impacts of uh, what was going on in the 18th century was that God really got reframed and sort of regarded in a way that God had never been seen before. God really got diminished, in fact, and came to be less central to the way that Europeans understood who God was. The God of the Enlightenment became a God who was very much relegated to the sidelines. He was no longer at the center. The God of the Enlightenment became very much a God of private life, and no longer did he belong in the public sphere. The God of the Enlightenment became very much a God of personal private morality, and no longer a god of universal ethics. The culture that we live in comes out of the Enlightenment and broadly shares these assumptions. Broadly, we share these assumptions about God, and this is the background chatter that I think probably most people in this room grew up with. And quite possibly somewhere deep within each of us is, 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 a, is a little bit of us that may be partly believes this Enlightenment story. When we just switch off a little bit, this is our kind of default position. This story that puts God somewhere on the edge and science in the middle, science at the center. As if what really matters isn't God at all. You know, God is peripheral to what we need to know to develop and to learn and to grow as a culture, as an organization. And what we, what we really need to focus on is science and technology, that they're what matters. Science is what has the capacity to explain everything we might believe. And certainly the story is that eventually the whole universe will become transparent to science. Eventually everything will be laid bare before the scientific endeavor. And we just need to bear in mind that this is culturally specific and that this is historically specific. This assumption isn't shared across the world today, it's not been shared throughout history, and these are a whole set of philosophical assumptions that really aren't a part of science at all. Science itself achieves amazing things, but it doesn't have the answer for everything. This week, as we heard, science has uh, been in the news because of the Higgs boson particle. Uh, Peter Higgs predicted mathematically in 1964 um, that uh, he had found an answer to a problem that was bothering physicists. Physicists were sitting around scratching their heads wondering why does everything have mass? Why does everything weigh so much? This is a, a question I have a lot of empathy with. Every morning when I get up and go into the bathroom and stand on the scales, I look down and I think, where does all this mass come from? <laughs> And, and obviously now I know that it's the Higgs boson particle and nothing to do with fried chicken. And <laughs> scientists in Switzerland have discovered evidence of this particle um, that might prove that his theory was correct. They've discovered evidence of a particle. It's important to say that they haven't actually seen the particle. You can't see this particle. What they've seen is evidence that it might exist. And the level of proof that they've got that it actually exists is basically there's a, there's a 2.5 million to 1 chance that they might be wrong. Yeah, there's a 2.5 million to 1 chance that they might be wrong. And you might think that's good enough, yeah? Do we all think that's good enough? 
I think that's good enough. I'd, 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 you know, I think that's good enough. I'd run with that. But let me just put that alongside another probability. Basically, science has accepted this week a probability of 2.5 million to one that the Higgs boson particle exists. Stephen Hawking says, the odds at all against a universe like ours emerging out of something like the Big Bang are enormous. I think there are clearly religious implications. It's been calculated that the odds of our universe happening at all in the way that we see it. So with all of the, uh, I think it's 15 constants that actually keep the physical universe exactly the way that it is, the odds against that happening conservatively are trillions to one. Trillions to one. The philosopher Alvin Plantinger has said, imagine that there's a man playing poker and he keeps on dealing himself straight aces. Round after round after round. Four rounds, say, on the trot. He keeps on dealing himself straight aces. Now, theoretically, this is possible. Yeah, theoretically, this could be chance that he's dealt himself straight aces four times in a row. But much more likely is that he's cheating. Yeah, that there's something else going on. For the universe to come about in the way that it has by chance, for all of these 15 physical constants to be holding the universe together in the way that we experience it, is theoretically possible. It's theoretically possible. But much more likely, surely, is that someone's passing cards underneath the table and keeping it all this way. Science doesn't have to be in conflict with faith in Jesus. Well, you might say, what about science and miracles? Does science prove that miracles don't happen? Does science prove that miracles don't happen? Well, science is all about explaining how things happen, how things are caused. And science, of course, is always looking for a natural explanation. So when science comes to something like a miracle, uh, science, the scientific method is always looking for a natural explanation. It's always looking for a natural explanation which can be repeated, which will be the case next time we observe a miracle. And of course, miracles don't work like that at all. It's not that science has disproved miracles. It's more that science doesn't have a framework at all for examining miracles. Science isn't looking at miracles, can't look at miracles, and how could it? And you can see, can't you, that basically, in the way that science comes to the miraculous, God is put on the edge. This is the Enlightenment assumption, again, that God is somewhere out here, and the real explanation is to be found with science. This is probably not such a big question for most people here, I'm guessing. You know, most of us now have grown up watching uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings, and the idea of a supernatural world with supernatural power going on around us isn't such a challenge uh, anymore. But one thing that we do have to notice is that when science talks about miracles, it talks about God breaking the rules. It talks about God breaking the physical rules of the universe. And that's not how Scripture talks about miracles. Scripture talks about miracles as about God showing us in advance how the world will look when creation is finished. This is what creation will look like when it's finished. God's people will all be raised from the dead, all of them. Sickness will be healed, all of it. The hungry will be fed and satisfied completely. This is what the world will look like. It's a preview, an advanced glimpse of what God's going to do with the whole world. So miracles might not be such an issue for us, but one, Christ one issue which Christians do still find difficult is the issue of evolution. Does the science of evolution, does evolution and the science behind it disprove the Bible? In other words, is there a collision between Genesis 1, Genesis 2 and science? 
Does evolution mean that the way that the Bible describes creation is in fact wrong? Do we have a head-on collision here? I don't think so. There are lots of different Christian thinkers who, first of all, understand evolution very differently, and secondly, who understand Genesis in a number of different ways. There are some Christians, uh, particularly in the creation science movement, who think that Genesis 1 teaches that God created the world in six periods of 24 hours, and he did it 6,000 years ago. And they would say that there's scientific evidence uh, to support this. And this is sometimes supported as the kind of the mainstream, bottom-line Christian view, you know, in the media. The media obviously wants to fight, and so this is a very good position, you know, to attack. Uh, Dawkins himself, whenever he presents this, he often presents this as the view that Christians ought to believe if they believe the Bible. But unfortunately, that just doesn't hold water. There are lots of Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, evangelical Christians who don't hold this view. Gordon Wenham doesn't hold this view. He's written the main commentary on Genesis, the main evangelical commentary on Genesis. B.B. Warfield doesn't hold this view. John Stott didn't hold this view. Tim Keller doesn't hold this view. How we come to this depends on how we understand evolution, and it's important to understand there are lots of different, or a number of different theories of evolution. And also how we read Genesis chapter 1 and uh, other passages in Scripture. And there are a number of different ways that we can do that. It's important, though, that we don't think that it's a choice between whether we read the Bible literally or not literally. We do read the Bible literally. But the question is, what kind of literature are we reading literally? So when we read Psalm 19 just then, we read uh, that... God in the heavens has pitched a tent for the sun. Now, no one has ever read that and thought that there's a tent in the sky where God keeps the sun. You know, it's telling us something completely different. This is poetry. And so it's telling us that, you know, in nature, the sun is like a bridegroom who's eagerly anticipated at a wedding. This is a wedding tent that the sun's meant to be in. Um, And that's meant to tell us something about God, who's a bridegroom who's eagerly anticipated in the midst of his people. When we come to a different book of the Bible, say maybe Luke, Luke's gospel is history. Luke is reporting the hard, observable facts of Jesus' life and ministry according to eyewitnesses. Now, for my money, Genesis 1 reads more like poetry. It reads more like poetry. There's lots of repetition, there's lots of patterns, there's lots of alliteration, there's lots of wordplay, there's lots of the stuff that you would find in poetry. Genesis 2, on the other hand, is more like a historical account. It focuses in on how God created human beings in the light of the theology of Genesis 1. When the Old Testament wants to do theology, it often uses poetry rather than prose. In the first five books uh, of the Bible, Moses often uses poems to help us understand the theological implications of what's going on. So all that to say that there doesn't have to be a conflict between the science of evolution and the Bible. As one evangelical commentary on Genesis concludes, there is little reason for conflict between the implications of Christian belief in the Creator and the scientific exploration of the way in which God has gone about his creating process. There is little reason for conflict between the implications of Christian belief in the Creator and the scientific exploration of the way in which God has gone about his creating process. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Whatever nature is telling us, it's describing the glory of God. It's telling us about the God who made it. If nature tells us about evolution, then it's showing God's glory as he shapes his creation. 
If nature reveals through scientific endeavour the Higgs boson particle, then they're doing that to God's glory. Those Higgs boson particles, if they exist, are singing God's glory. They're joining all the choirs of the, the other quantum particles, all of the leptons and gluons and neutrinos and photons, and I've run out of, um, of any others that you can think of. They're all singing God's praise together. They're singing God's praise and bringing glory to God because they're doing exactly what God created them for. God speaks through the natural world. God is glorified in the natural world. The natural world tells us who God is and what he's made. And it's not enough. It's not enough. Psalm 19, David tells us, verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. So nature is an imperfect communicator. Yeah, nature is using non-verbal communication, which can not always be clear. It can be easy to misinterpret. It can be easy to ignore. It can be easy to distort. But David describes the word of God in Scripture as perfect. He talks about God's law here. He talks about God's statutes, God's precepts, God's commands, God's ordinances. And all of these are synonyms for Scripture. Altogether, David is saying that Scripture is perfect. He uses other words to describe it here. Trustworthy, right, radiant, pure. You can feel that David loves to hear God speak in Scripture. He's passionate about hearing God speak in Scripture. He's building his life on this. He's trusting God with his life as God speaks to him out of Scripture. And it's every part of Scripture. Verse 9, the ordinances of the Lord are sure, and all of them, all of them, are righteous. Every verse of Scripture is certain and true and clear and righteous from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation. And that means that we can get something from listening to God speak in Scripture that we can't get from hearing God speak to us in nature. We can get something from hearing God speak to us in Scripture that we can't get from doing science. And that's the power of God's Word acting directly in our lives. I'm just going to pull out three ways uh, from this psalm that, that God's Word does that in our lives. First of all, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. Refreshing the soul, literally, that's giving me back my life. That word soul can mean life in Hebrew, giving me back my life. Scripture gives you back your life. When we turn away from God in nature or we turn away from God in Scripture, we turn from life to death. When we come to Scripture, we get our life back. The power of Scripture giving us back our life. Secondly, verse 7 again, the statutes of the Lord make wise the simple. Scripture gives us a wisdom that we can't find for ourselves. When I think of myself 15 years ago, um, I wasn't a Christian then, and I think that I wasn't very wise. You know, I was making tons of mistakes. I was spending all my money on expensive motorbikes and on a season ticket to West Ham, and uh, I believed a lot of nonsense at the time. And, you know, I need to ask, will I, in 15 years' time, look back on me now and ask myself, you know, how on earth could I have done that? How on earth could I have believed that? The Bible gives us wisdom. It helps us to avoid the mistakes that we'll look back on with regret. The power of Scripture is to give us wisdom. And finally, there in verse 8, the precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart, David says. They're sweeter than honey. God's word is exhilarating, and it's delicious, and it's exciting. And David is excited and delighted by the beauty of God's word as God's word speaks into his life. He's captivated by God's word. He's enchanted and in love with God's word. And this is the power of Scripture that we can't get from hearing God speak in nature. It's the power of Scripture which gives us back our life. It's the power of Scripture which gives us wisdom, even though we're simple. It's the power of Scripture which gives us a joy and a delight in God's presence. But there's still a problem. 
And David identifies it there in verse 12. He says, who can discern their own errors? Who can discern their own errors? He goes on to talk about hidden faults. He goes on to talk about willful and deliberate sins. Errors, mistakes, hidden faults, deliberate sin. These are all things which get in the way of us hearing God speak to us. Whether we're doing science or whether we're just doing life, error and sin get in the way of us hearing God speak. And yet David knows that this this isn't the end. You know, this isn't the last word. He says at the end of his psalm, May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So David trusts that the thoughts and the motives of his heart, that his intentions and his plans can be pleasing to God. And he knows that this is possible when it's the last word of the psalm because God is a redeemer. And however clear that was to David, it's very clear to us because we know that he's talking prophetically about Jesus. Jesus is God's redeeming word. Jesus rescues us, redeems us from our ignorance. Jesus rescues us from our willful self-delusion about the things that God wants us to know, the things that he's telling us from nature and from scripture. Jesus makes it possible for our hearts to be changed, not just to understand God in nature, but to love to hear him, to love to hear him speak intimately with us in scripture about everything that he's done for us. And that's good news. I'm going to pray for us. And I just actually introduced the panel. Shall I do that? <laughs> so as they're kind of having the chance to think about it. So this is Steve. Um, he did a maths degree in Oxford. How about that? No, 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 no. Well, okay, he, did, he, he studied maths. A degree. There. And John is a philosopher, amongst other things. And Bookie is a microbiologist by training. Darren hasn't studied science. He's a psychologist, yes. Um, I actually studied an engineering degree. You might not realize that. But anyway, there we go. Um, <laughs> so a uh, very good kind of selection of backgrounds and thinking and so on. So who'd like to, answer, who'd like to have a go at answering this question? One minute. Have a go. John. Come on side. Um, great question. I think um, the simple answer is, is we don't. Um, Really, when um, we think about kind of how people have interpreted the Bible or interpreted their own faith or looked at you know, the world around them, then actually we discover both with science but also with theology, there's an ongoing kind of understanding and discussion that goes on amongst scientists but also amongst the church as well. I think one of the, the questions somebody put to me recently was having looked back in history and looked at all the mistakes the church has made about interpreting the Bible but also how they've engaged with society, what do you think the main problem the church has today and what will we regret in 100 years' time looking back? So I think, you know, yes, God is the same, but absolutely we will go on discussing things and understanding more about God and the world as science does and as the church does. Thank you. Anyone else want to? Yeah, Bookie. Um, I think it depends on what aspects of God... Um, I think you can distill certain aspects of God that remain fixed within any given context. I think one of them is that God is. Um, And the other one is that God is knowable. And then perhaps um, another one is that God revealed himself at a given specific point in history through Jesus. And so if you have those three distilled truths, then you can um, synthesize whatever um, philosophical stance or faith um, um, doctrine from those three um, fixed points. And, you know, this is part of just being a friend of God and a child of God. It's an adventure. It's okay to get things wrong and not to know everything. It's a relationship and it's beautiful and it's slowly being unraveled to us personally and to the entirety of humanity. Great answer. Thank you. Let's have the next question. 
if human beings are made in the image of God, and evolution is true, at which point did primates develop a soul? Okay, here we go. We're really kind of plunging in now. So, um, who'd like to have a go with this? Yeah, Darren. Yeah. Um, okay, lot, people come at this in lots of different ways. So this is, there, isn't, there isn't a right answer. So really what I'm giving you is like for my money, if you like. Um, I don't think primates did develop a soul. I don't think, so, I don't think like that, that, you know, God breathed uh, his life into the first human being. I think that happened. I think, I think you have to have, even if you believe in evolution, you have to have a first human being. You have to have an Adam, because otherwise Jesus doesn't make sense. You know, the whole idea of one person representing the human race, does to, the, the whole thing falls apart. So, you know, you can have evolution. Uh, you, can, you can even have e evolution of the first person. But there has to be that point where the first man is, you know, is, is, uh, where God breathes into Adam, the first man, and, and Adam becomes a living being, a nepesh in Hebrew. Um, and that point makes Adam representative of everything that comes after. So that did, that, that's nothing at all to do with evolution. That's a moment in salvation history. is something that God did. Thank you. Anyone want to add to that? Yeah. Sorry, to extend that a bit further, I think one of the things I was reading this week was saying in the same way that God called um, Abraham or Abram, it's almost like a similar kind of moment almost that kind of that God came and breathed and created kind of the first man at a point in evolution. So there has to be kind of this this Adam and this kind of Eve create, uh, kind of created, but there was this kind of breathed in moment very much in the same way that was happened kind of with the call of Abraham. That's kind of some of the stuff that I was reading this week. But there's, um, yeah, lots of different theories on it. I just have a question. Yeah? I think what, did I, what does that word soul in that question represent? Because Hebrews um, didn't see human in, in a tripartite um, as being, so I don't really understand the question. But mm. Yeah, that's just important to say that, we, that this whole thing about the soul um, is a kind of sub Western sort of philosophical construct, and most often we translate that as life. It's why in Psalm 19, when I said, you know, it's translated as refreshes the soul, quite rightly, that's a, that's a good way to translate it. But essentially, that word soul is the same as the word for life in Hebrew, nepesh, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you could say, Adam, you know, God breathed into Adam and he became a soul, uh, it's, this, it's the same word, or he became a living being. Um, that's how it's usually translated. Okay. Great. Let's have the next question. God declared his creation good and human beings very good, but evolution implies that evolution is not complete. How can these ideas coexist? It's a good question. God declared his creation good and human beings very good, but evolution implies that evolution is not complete. How can these ideas coexist? Okay, Everyone's looking at me, but I don't know why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, I haven't said anything yet, so I, I should. I, should um, I don't know. It's a very good question. I've I've never even conceived of that question before. Um, I think I think the way I would a approach it, just personally, if you know, if I had to give an answer to this question to a, a friend of mine, which I guess I am, um, is that. Evolution, as for me, evolution as a concept implies that things are, are changing according to their environment, um, and uh, I guess in, in some way you could say improving in terms of the way that, that they are able to, to cope. Um, but I don't think in terms of um, I don't think we're, we're getting to the point where we have s sort of super creatures compared to the creatures that God created. I think there's, so evolution is this idea of of changing in, in adaption. I don't think it's, for me, it doesn't necessarily mean getting better as a sort of, this, this sort of, I don't know, this pure concept of somehow uh, a monkey now being better than, than the monkey was back then. It's just the world changes and, and evolution means that they stay alive. So for me, it doesn't mean better. It just means different. Thank you. Any other? Yeah, Bucky. Um, I think God said very good. He didn't say perfect. Mm. And um, so it means, it, it, you know, if, um, if you 
say that it may perhaps evolution makes things better because you're better adapted you, to your environment than that perhaps God didn't complete um, his work in, in Genesis. But what I, what I thought, and I'm going to um, postulate this with caution, I think it's, there's, a, there's a fear when you hinge um, the ontology of God or the existence of God on a, on a scientific um, discovery is that if that scientific discovery or, or hypothesis comes into question, then God comes into question. So I'm doing this with caution. You could argue that um, the f fully revealed man um, in, in the end times, when Christ comes again, that perhaps that is the summit of evolution. But I do it with great caution. Yes. Very good. I think just to add to that, um, it's interesting the whole question of, um, you know, if you look at progress in man, say, particularly over the last 200 years, the Industrial Revolution and so on, um, actually we're still not very good at not sinning. And um, so there are some things that don't change uh, alongside things that do. So just to throw that in. Let's have the next question. Evolution implies death, danger, and random mutation. How can this exist before the fall? Evolution implies death, danger, and random mutation. How can this exist before the fall? So um, this question that evolution perhaps is built into the framework of the universe by God and um, uh, pre-fall. And so what happens? So John, do you want to give... Um, are you going to have a go at this? Okay. Just trying to work out your hand signals. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, let's get to the crux of the matter, really. We're looking at um, whether the Bible can be matched up against the creation or kind of the world. I think that's fairly clear, isn't it? Yes? No? That seems to me what the question's asking about. Um, okay, good. Um, I think I, I need to go to the loo, so um, hopefully, kind of Darren said this um, at some point <laughs> in his talk, but um, really kind of the ways to interpret Genesis are either kind of a literal... Um, way of looking at it, uh, looking at it kind of an allegorical way, so kind of like a story or representation of something that happened, or you're looking kind of at what would be termed kind of anthropologically, so actually kind of a revelation in time to a people that understood very little about the universe or the way in which, you know, if you tried to explain me, the Higgs boson, I would struggle. But if imagine trying to explain the Higgs boson to somebody, you know, a long time ago, they'd struggle even more so. And I think that as kind of Darren um, spoke about when I was in the room and not nipping off to the loo through multiple doors, um, that, you know, that different people kind of interpret that part of the Bible in different ways. And I think if you're interpreting in seven literal 24-hour periods, then I think you might have some challenges around that. I think if you actually interpret it in either an allegorical or a kind of a more of a... Uh, a kind of a, a kind of a anthropological kind of way, then actually that question kind of falls away to a to a certain degree. So that's kind of how I would I would look at that, and many scientists would would kind of look at those three different ways. Okay, yeah, Darren, do you want to say? Yeah, I mean, I think the issue is uh, that there's a number of places in Scripture where it, it seems to say that that death comes into the world through Adam's sin. Um, and it's kind of, what does, it, what does scripture mean when it says death comes into the world through Adam's sin? There's two things to say. First of all, there was death before the fall. And we can get that from the biblical text. It's kind of Adam's given um, all of the plants of the field to eat. Now, presumably, they don't stay alive after he's eaten them. They're dead. So there's, there's death in the world before the fall. Um, so it's, it's referring to human death. But the other thing is the understanding of death. And death for us... Um, you know, as Christians, doesn't just mean, you know, life stopping. It means the whole separation from God, which is part of the curse that comes about as, as part of the fall. And again, that is a historical moment. That's a moment in salvation history. Um, but it's not necessarily. I mean, it is often flagged up as something that's incompatible um, with uh, evolution. But I, I, again, I, I don't think it is. Um, I think there is scriptural evidence. You know, scripture bears witness to death being there in creation uh, before the fall. And it doesn't explicitly say that it wasn't either, but that death for human beings, you know, does come into existence at Adam's sin, and it means something, you know, very different, I think. Thank you. Uh, next question. How do we read the Bible knowing which is poetry and which is literal? How can we be sure... The resurrection of Jesus isn't poetry. Steve? Um, 
I'll, 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 give an, <laughs> I'll give an elementary answer to this. Is, um, and for me, coming at, uh, I, I believe that the whole of the Bible is true. Um, and I think, f- for me, it's, it's really about context. Um, I think I'm particularly, um, Darren highlighted it earlier, where you have sort of the Psalms are, are songs and poetry, and it's art. It's, it's David expressing himself and expressing his relationship with God, where he's at. He cries out, and he uses very colorful language intentionally because that's part of his creative spirit. And you have someone like Luke who sets out at the very beginning of his book and he says, you know, he, he intentionally states, I have set out to write an account based on um, evidence and based on, um, on eyewitness accounts. And, and so, I mean, in a, in a sort of very early way, that is one um, simple way of, of starting to um, sort between what you think is maybe being written in a colourful way and what is being written in a very straightforward way, which is purely what the writer was trying to achieve. Um, and what it looks like around it. So a lot of the gospel accounts are, this is what Jesus did. He went and spoke to this person, and then at this time he went and did this. And, and, and it's sort of set out in a very sort of historical, factual way, um, whereas things like um, the Psalms, Proverbs, um, and, and things like that are written in a way that is meant to be art. So that's how I would begin, and now Darren will tell you how you will continue. <laughs> Go on then, Darren. Yep. Um, yeah, one, I suppose one minute. The, okay, the first thing is that um, poetry isn't the opposite of literal. I just want to flag that up. Um, that poetry is meant to be read literally as well. It's kind of just literal in a different way. Uh, and we're not free to come to a text, or you could be free to come to a text. We're not free to come to the biblical text and decide randomly what's poetry and what's you know what what's history and what's uh, prose it's kind of like the text tells us it indicates very clearly um you know what's to be read in which way as 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 we've seen now there are some texts that are a little bit more difficult to um you know to kind of uh, decide how are we supposed to be reading this but they're very few um and actually mostly it's very clear so if a text has got you know lots of rhyming lots of alliteration lots of repetition um if it's if its structure is primarily kind of symbolic and you know uh, literary rather than you know to do with history and the way that the sequence of events then you kind of think yeah okay this is this is poetry it doesn't mean that you're then free to kind of you know interpret use it as a metaphor for whatever you like you know the text tells you what you how you're to apply it um, and the text of Genesis 1 is amazingly complex in a way which, you know, if you actually Five just seconds. treat it as a, as a, as a sequence of events, uh, you actually rob the text of that complexity. Mm-hmm. And I think in this um, as well, there are literary scholars, some of whom are not Christians, who would describe the resurrection accounts not as poetry. They would say these are written as history and there's a choice as to whether you believe them or not. So, um, and... You know, the, and you can take the evidence on its own, uh, on its own account. So it is, you know, literary scholars. And this is where it's it's worth looking at things like commentaries and that kind of thing to to develop your knowledge um, of how the Bible works, um, because they'll help to show you those things. Okay, next question. Um, as science discovers more, will we cease to need God to fill the gaps, fill in the gaps? So this is um, uh, addressing a a problem that I think emerged uh, in the, at the beginning of the Enlightenment, where people were beginning to say, well, science is proving all of this, but what about this gap that we, you know, it doesn't say anything about this, and that's where God, um, you know, that's, God explains that, um, what science can't explain. And of course, as science um, grows in its understanding, um, with that argument, it begins to take ground from the, the gap theory, and so you, you're left with nothing left to discover about God. So it's, it's clear it's not a, that's not a Christian um, a concept of the God of the gaps. And they, the medieval Christians, I think, made some mistakes by um, going with that. So as science discovers more, that's what's behind this question, will we cease to need God to fill in the gaps? So who'd like to um, have a go with this? Yeah, Bookie. Yeah. And then Steve. Um, I'm just trying to answer. It's, it's a really good question. Um, I think there's one gap that will never be um, filled by science, um, and I'm going to dabble into philosophy and try and explain it, is a Kantian concept that 
you are um, just by ob you're observing um, a set of um, phenomena and you are observing it is subject to you we sort of as Christians we believe that because whatever you discover in science is subject to man even if you replicate it within set parameters it's still subject to our powers of observation and recording um, what's happened but I think God is outside of that God is um, is outside of our um, sub subjective um, observations and that is a gap that's very difficult to fill by science because no matter where you take it you still have that thing where you know that is subject to our observations um, yeah I mean I, I would I would definitely agree with that and I think it comes back to this idea about how if we if we base the if we prove God via some sort of scientific um, thing that we can see well when when our understanding of that scientific principle changes we suddenly lose the argument if you like for God and um, and so I would say yes you know historically there probably have been things that we've there probably are maybe still are things that we attribute to God incorrectly um, and and you know God reveals himself to us with and within our understanding of, of the world but um, I mean I would say for me it comes down to two two things um, one which was a question put to me by a good friend of mine he talking over this idea said um, you know well what would be the question that science can answer that would for you shake your faith in God um, because I'm not sure I can think of one um, and I think primarily my reason for that is I don't believe in God because of something that I think that because of, of something that I see I, I believe in him and I love him as a response to what he's done for me and that is not a not something that I see in front of me but it's something that I, I know so I guess maybe I come at that slightly differently it's a response to him not because I believe that he makes the wind blow or because I yeah okay do you want to add to that yeah, just very quickly. Um, the God of philosophy, who, who might be an explanatory variable that fills in the gaps, is not the God of the Bible. Yeah. That's the really important thing. It's kind of like the God of the Bible is not an explanatory variable to fill in the gaps of what we don't know. You know, he's the initiator of everything that is, uh, and he's sovereign over everything that happens uh, and everything that's going on. Um, and he's got a project which is to bring us home to himself, uh, and that's the God of the Bible. And that's very different to what philosophers are talking about when they talk about proofs of God. Thank you. Let's have one more question. No more? No more? No more. Okay, we've run out of time. Um, <laughs> these guys have done brilliantly, haven't we? <laughs> well, actually, we're over time. Let's give them a big clap. They've been absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much indeed.